I was told earlier today that when this morning I was speaking and this lectern was leaning toward the front row and the people there felt jeopardized, so I'm delighted I scared you. So. <laughs> Now, those of you who are not familiar, Jack, R.T., and I have been now almost 100 Word Spirit Power conferences. We each speak uh, 15 or 20 minutes, tonight 20. So turn on your hearing aid and listen fast. I'm Lord God Almighty. Nobody's come here to hear me. You don't want to hear me. I don't want to hear me. We want your word. And as you bring it currently to us, Lord, and currently to the church, and what's happening in the church today, help us to benefit by that and to grow in grace and knowledge through it. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm reading in Matthew 10, first verse, And when Jesus had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits, to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts. And he gives further instructions. I want, with God's grace, to teach on a very wonderful subject tonight that has to do with when disciples today obey this word and expect these results, what the Holy Spirit will still do. God has not retired. He has not disappeared into history. He is still alive and active on the earth and in churches, regardless of names and signs out front of buildings, but alive and working in people who will respond to the leadership of His Holy Spirit. And tonight I want to focus in a teaching primarily on one wonderful American brother who was willing to do that. His name was Tommy Hicks an American evangelist, and in the course of my ministry and lifetime, that man, one obedient servant, changed the world. No question about it. In my early years of ministry, Latin America was over 99% Roman Catholic. There was only one very small, microscopic number of Latins who were evangelical. God used Tommy Hicks, 1954, to change that. He was an unassuming American who was invited to Buenos Aires to preach in a revival. And evangelicals were very frightened to do much publicly because of the overwhelming sense of inferiority politically and in other ways. But Tommy Hicks went determined to obey God. And after he arrived there, he told the little group of evangelicals who had brought him down that they needed to ask use of the 15,000-seat stadium in Buenos Aires. And when he said that, these little frightened evangelicals drew back. He said, you don't understand. This is Catholic Argentina. Now, with all kindness, 
and without throwing rocks at anyone, because thank God for Roman Catholics who have become believers in Jesus. But at that time, Latin America was still not fully rescued from the Inquisition. In my lifetime, and I'll be 90 years old next year, in my lifetime, evangelicals in Peru were dragged through the streets of the city and stoned to death. No priest, no policeman rescued them. They were martyred. And as a teenager, I was a, grew up in Miami and was an exchange student to Cuba. It was a short trip, but a goodwill tour. And we made a visit into Old Moro Castle. And what I saw in that castle haunts me, in a sense, to this day. It was a small group of other students uh, on that tour. They took us into Moro, into a long, dark dungeon. We stopped at a drape, and the guide said, this is the execution chamber, where evangelicals and others of criminals were put to death. And then he suddenly threw back the drape. And in the original execution instruments, there was a wax image of an execution in progress. Now, none of us knew that what we were going to see, but it looked as real as me now, you looking at me and my looking at you. These wax images were that real. And it was a man strapped in a chair. I hate to say this, but it's necessary. Strapped in a chair with a bar behind his neck and another bar in front of his neck, a very large, burly man was slowly turning a wheel and pushing his head off. Um, across against the wall was the Iron Maiden, a closet standing up that the victim was put inside it, and the door slowly closed, but the door had spikes like eight, ten inches long, slowly penetrated the victims and killed them. Now, those instruments were still there. And then later, <coughs> in Peru, I went into the chamber there where evangelicals were sentenced to death, and I presume it's still there, and the cave close by where their corpses were thrown. Now, again, I'm only saying that because of I, what God Almighty has done in Latin America through one initial voice. Now, there were others in Latin America who were praying for revival to come. But Tommy Hicks went, met these few evangelicals, told them that they needed to get a bigger stadium because God was going to do more than they had imagined, and they were frightened by him. He said, well, I'm going to the palace and, and call on President Perón. Not a one of them would go with him. Not a one. I have stood <laughs> on the steps in the presidential palace in, in Argentina where somewhere along that spot that dear young American stood. And when he walked up, the a soldier asked him, said, what do you want? And he, Tommy said, I want to speak to the president. And the soldier laughed at him, said, you can't speak to the president. Why do you want to speak to the president? And he said, because God has sent me to Argentina to hold a healing salvation crusade. Well, the soldier was not interested in healing. No, he was not interested in salvation, but he was very interested in healing because at that moment he had severe pain in his body. And when Tommy said, God has sent me to Argentina to hold a healing crusade, the soldier stopped him and said, can God heal me? Tommy said, give me your hands. <laughs> Took his hands, prayed for him, and there on the steps of the presidential palace, the soldier was healed. He told Tommy, he told Tommy, he said, come back tomorrow, you will see the president. 
Tommy went back the next day and was greeted by the soldier, escorted into the office, and stood before President Perón. Perón asked him, said, what is it you're wanting? And Tommy said, I want use of this 15,000 seat stadium because God's going to do a miracle here in Argentina. What kind of a miracle? And he said, well, God has sent me to hold a healing and salvation crusade. And exactly like the soldier, Perón was not interested in the salvation, but he said to Tommy, can God heal me? Now, what the Argentine public did not know, because Perón was at that point avoiding public appearances, he had an eczema that was spreading over his body that no doctor in Argentina could heal. And when Tommy said, a healing crusade, and Perón said, can God heal me? And Tommy said, give me your hands. <laughs> Prayed for him. And on the spot, President Perón was healed. <laughs> now, you can, you can ridicule that, deny that, but let me tell you, the photographs were in the national papers. I myself have seen those pictures. At any rate, when uh, Tommy took his hands and prayed for President Perón, and instantly, Perón shouted out, my God, I'm healed. And he was. He was healed. He said, you'll have the stadium. Now, the short of it was this. They only started out with that 15,000-seat stadium. But they then moved, eventually, to the 184,000-seat Huracan Stadium and filled it. <laughs> Now, it wasn't just Argentina or Buenos Aires that God had his eye on, because fast-forwarding from 1954 to now, there's now more than 100 million evangelicals in Latin America. And there has been a revival throughout Latin America that, hear this, is equal to everything that Martin Luther ever accomplished. People are unaware of that. Numerically, the current revival in Latin America is even greater than what happened with Martin Luther. But at any rate, they quickly moved to the Hurricane Stadium, and <clears throat> the newspapers carried the daily reports and pictures, President Perón, and the pictures were in the newspaper, President Perón stood on the platform with Tommy Hicks and told how he himself was healed. Well, you know what, had hap what happened then? Thousands and thousands of people began crowding into the stadium. Some slept there all night. And it was wintertime, and the stadium was metal, and they slept on those metal ramps all night long just to be sure that they could have a seat. There was one of the national newspaper men who, that everybody knew who had been in a wheelchair all his life. And there on the platform in front of thousands, he leaped out of that wheelchair and ran across the stadium. <laughs> Peasants, peasants from all over Argentina came, brought their little cooking gear, their campfires, and lived in the area. But my point in telling you that is this. God had his eye not only on Argentina, but he had his eye on the whole of Latin America. And if you know the story today, Pastor and his wife were in Colombia just a year and a half ago, um, what was the name of the church? Okay, that's only one. There's another one there in, in Bogota, hear this, that has a one million seat amphitheater, side of a mountain. And what are they doing? They're not just preaching feel good messages. They're just not feeding the public religious pills. They are proving the reality that Jesus Christ is alive. <laughs> mm. 
There's a church in Bogota, Bethesda Missionary Church. That's the one I think, with, at least there's, uh, uh, there's so many of them there. But the, uh, Bethesda Church has services 24 hours around the clock. They never quit. There's always someone there preaching. They minister deliverance 24 hours around the clock. They cast out demons like Jesus told the church to do. They pray for the sick. They see them healed. They lead the unsaved to Christ. They get the drug addicts off the street. They minister to them in the authority of God Almighty. And that one church is shaking the whole of Latin America. But <clears throat> what you also must know is that what God began in my life, the lifetime of my ministry, has now produced more than 100 million converts just in Latin America alone. Now, <clears throat> I want you, as a, as a parallel thought, to be aware of this. Latin America is not the only place this is happening. The same time in Africa, another 100 million brought to Christ. In China, another 100 million brought to Christ. So what is happening in our day? While much of the American church is in its comfortable sleep, the Holy Spirit is moving in other parts of the world. Now, those of you know that I'm here today, those that were not here this morning, observing my 70th year of ministry. Jack is serve, observing 71 or something like that. But the point being, we are old timers. We are not inexperienced jerks. We may be jerks, but we're not inexperienced. <laughs> We are also witnessing the power of the Holy Spirit. But our target is this. Lord, do in America, the U.S., what you're doing in other parts of the world. Holy Spirit, come, move here, fulfill the commission, the ministry that Jesus gave. The most key point Casting out demons. Modern church doesn't believe there are demons. No, people have bad dreams. And people need medication, and that's going to solve the problem. I can tell you it absolutely will not do it. And what's happening in the church, the evangelical charismatic church in Latin America, is they're preaching the full gospel. And by the way... It's important to know this, that 85% of all conversions taking place worldwide, 85% of all Christian conversions taking place worldwide are taking place, being done by those who preach the full gospel message, who unashamedly minister deliverance. Now, I myself came into renewal in, I was ordained in 1949, as many of you know. I came into renewal in the power of the Holy Spirit in 1977. And that happened when a young spirit-filled prisoner in the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary, whom I had gone there to counsel, <laughs> laid hands on me. And God reversed our roles. I was in, though my church did not know it, my family did not know it, I was in suicidal depression. I was wanting, hoping, somehow I could get off the planet. The day that young prisoner laid hands on me and I went home, the Holy Spirit fell on me, and my Baptist ministry was ended forever. <laughs> now, 
You understand this. I love Baptists. I love Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Lutherans. I don't care what kind of a label you've got on your coat. That's going to stay behind in the resurrection anyway. The only important thing is that we be disciples of Jesus Christ, believe what he taught, accept it without criticism, and move forward in kingdom power. So bless you. That's my prayer and my hope that all of us, Jack, come, all of us. <laughs> <laughs> I know that I look only 27 years old, and Jack is, looks so much older than I, but I'm really older than he, and I have to admit it, but he's so dear. I love you, guy. <laughs> I have asked, as I, I never do, for the uh, this period of time instead of the first, because I think I th have some things to tell you that are very important to what's about to happen here. Uh, I'm right now in the toughest season of my life. Oh, a matter of a month ago, I experienced something that cannot be described because I was in and out of it. The, the bottom line is that uh, I've been uh, diagnosed with, uh, with a heart disease that is uh, very critical, and uh, it, it affects every part of me. So I think I have some things uh, I want you to pray for me as I pray for you, because I heard something this morning. So I think Charles uh, said something about it, and I, I certainly entered in. Revival, whatever it is, is intensely personal. And uh, it is God's pleasure to count every one of you in on it. Now, when revival came to my church in Castle Hills, we had less than, well, we probably had 700 members. But when revival came, people got in on it. And so we, we got to where we could say it almost without thinking, God is up to something. He wants you to get in on it. If you don't get in on what God is up to, you're going to be out of it. And so I want to tell you that as you face a church entering in, and I believe that's what's happening to Revive Church. I believe, I believe within the year the church will be aflame with a noticed and heralded uh, time of revival. And... Uh, uh, I, I think it matters not to you, uh, but that it will be, it'll be one of those that will be heralded. It will be, it will be noticed. It will be written about. It will be, it will become a prototype for churches all over the world. <laughs> Being uh, a part of a move of God in the past made me uh, wary, uh, not suspicious, but wary of when, uh, when something I heard about was heralded as a move of God, I wanted to be there. And so I heard, read in the um, magazines, Time, U.S. News, World Report, and so on, and then major papers about the reviving in Toronto. Now, it came under a lot of things because there were, there were things happened there that didn't ordinarily happen. And uh, if I were to tell you these, 
you'd be somewhat bothered, but you better get your botherer repaired because God <laughs> is going to do something that in revealing your heart will also reveal your need. And God will try you. Are you ready for this? And walk something by you that will be absolutely beyond uh, anything you'd ever think of. And I don't know why this comes up, but in the process of what happened after I started going to, uh, to Toronto, I went to England and, and preached in Southampton and preached in, uh, oh goodness, uh, on, uh, all over really. But I, I went to a church in northern uh, England, and uh, the pastor's name uh, flees from me right now. And he had weird things. It seemed that the longer they lasted, the weirder they got. <laughs> and uh, critical things came. You know what? I believe now that God allows those who have critical spirits working in them to reveal themselves, expose themselves, so that they'll have a clear chance to get right. So that's ahead of you. So uh, the, the Lord will allow things to happen. And I'll tell you what happened there. A, a lady had been gloriously moved in the revival, and her husband was very lost, decisively lost, uh, self-contenting, in his lostness and, and, and reactive to any uh, possibility of witness. And she was blessed in the meeting, and God was blessing in the meeting there in the north of England. And uh, she would talk to her husband when she got home and tell him what was going on. And, and finally, he just relented and said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I will go with you to church. And if the pastor crawls under the grand piano and starts barking like a dog, I will relent to Christ. Now, he shouldn't have done that if he didn't want to get saved. That's daring to God. So the man went to church. I, I move you now to the pastor and his wife who are sitting now, getting prepared to hear the message of the evening. And he turned to his wife and said, Honey, I've got the strangest feeling that God wants me to go get under the grand piano and bark like a dog. This is true. And she said, Well, if God says for you to do it, I think you better do it. And he got up in the middle of the service, went over, got under the grand piano, and began to bark like a dog. This woman and her husband was there. And, and, and the husband said, I want to be saved. I want to be saved. And got saved. Now, I, I don't know whether God likes to do things like that. <laughs> Evidently, he likes to because he does. And he does as he will. So I want you to keep that in mind, and I'll tell some stories. I want to tell one other before I go into the body of what I want to say. And uh, this is one of them. The first person I dealt with, and I, listen, I told God. I said, God, I'll do all this standing against the devil and, and preach on the devil and his and his ministry and try to spotlight him and expose him all I can, but I'm going to have to have some education to do anything about demons. And if there's anything to this demon business, I want to know it. Now there's another dare to God. <laughs> uh, within months, my youth director came to me and said, there's a young man who sings with the sopranos in the choir and he wants to be delivered. Now, he didn't tell me uh, what it was. Uh, they didn't tell us what it was from. But they brought him in, and the Lord revealed. Well, he said it. He said, I'm homosexual. Now, just don't let this get out, but this really happened. 
There's no need to confuse the world with it, so guard who you tell. And he came out. He had a voice, rather naturally, uh, up with the sopranos and above. And uh, when he came out with this voice, the voice was that of an octave above them. And he said, he said, I have a demon. I am a homosexual. And uh, it made me mad. I, I just got mad. I said, he's putting me on. He's trying to bother me. And so I just thought I'd get mad back at him. And I began to stand against this spirit, and the spirit knocked him off on the floor. He began to writhe like a snake, jump up and down like a fish, and, and I wanted to kick him. I, 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 I think I probably raised back to kick him. And he was kickable at that point. He was exposed. I could have kicked him. And uh, he began to writhe under the coffee table, through the legs of the coffee table, and under several chairs, and, and moved over to a place in front of a, of a big window that overlooked the parking lot. The next thing I knew, something seemed to grab him by the seat of his pants and the nap of his shirt, the nap of his neck, and throw him at the window. It broke the window, and it scared the bejesus out of me. I mean, it, it scared me and scared my youth director. And uh, we, we, somebody told me, never touch a person with a demon. Well, how in heaven's name are you going to deal with them if you don't touch them? Sometimes you have to grab them. Sometimes you have to throw them down. And uh, it was he going out a broken window or our grabbing him. And so we grabbed him and pulled him back in, and he pulled a flowered, a, a, a potted flower, a potted plant, off with him and began to eat the potted plant and eat the dirt. Uh, I thought to myself, we have a problem here. <laughs> and the only thing I knew is that youth director and I, she was a lady, uh, the, uh, we were the only ones dealing. I said, go get help. We need help. We can't handle him ourselves. And, and that evening, for, uh, for I don't know how long, he threw us one way and then another. And finally, finally God conquered him. And, and he was a splendid, splendid young man. I could tell you some more things about him. But it, it, uh, there are times the enemy wants back where he's lived. And so get used to that. I don't know whether it'll, uh, if it's necessary, it's going to be. And if it bees, it probably is necessary, okay? So just get ready. What would you do if somebody says, we want you to be on the deliverance team? Well, you better get ready. I'd read the Bible. I'd justify in your spirit whether God still does that or not. And I want to assure you that he does. I could sit here and tell you all night things that have happened uh, in that church that never had dealt, to my knowledge, with a demon before. Okay, now, I want to talk with you about the future of this church. And I, I, I don't know that future. I don't know your past. But I do know the, 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 the past and the future of the span of time I'm telling about the Castle Hills. It was First Baptist Church. I don't, I don't think that name has been changed. I don't know why we didn't change it, because it was a way far piece away from what a First Baptist Church was. <laughs> I remember the First Baptist Church pastor, who was a famous man at the time, had dear friends in the church that were moneyed friends, and, and uh, generally when they asked him to do something, he did it out of respect, and probably because they were rich. But uh, he was sitting with them, I think on the second row one night, and they were lifting their hands in worship. And uh, uh, it was one of those evenings. And uh, I, I saw him look this way and that and, and went like this. I said, he was scared to death. He was a great man. Everybody in, in the state knew him, and he was Mr. Baptist. But God moved. Now, that was the night, if I remember correctly, when another man came 
rushing down the aisle, draped himself on the altar, and began to pray. God uh, just told me, I, I, I don't even remember what he told me, but it, it meant that I needed to go to him and ask about his, uh, his situation. I went and knelt by him. Uh, no, I picked him, I, I picked him off the altar, and we went in a side room, knelt down, and I said, what's going on? And he said, preacher, I'm, I'm from uh, South America. I think it was Colombia. I don't remember. But he said, I'm an old time. He was president of the seminary, the Southern Baptist Seminary in the area. And he said, I'm an old, worn-out missionary, and if God does not do something, I'm going back and resign and will be done with the whole thing. He was filled with the Spirit gloriously that night. Now, he went back and he was reticent to tell about it. The lady who led me into the Spirit-filled life was Miss Bertha Smith, a career missionary to China in that great Shantung revival in uh, North China. She and all of the missionaries, Episcopalian, Methodist, uh, Presbyterians, and Southern Baptists, several of them, uh, were filled with the Holy Spirit and healed many of them. And God moved. Now, uh, that lady was, uh, was Bertha Smith, and uh, everybody knew who she was. And I, I've, I've lost my channel of thinking, uh, so let, just give me a minute. There are times when you get as old as I, when the bird flies off the limb. <laughs> and if I will pause and be honest like I'm doing, the bird flies back, gets on the limb, and I begin to see the bird come back. Look at me. The bird has just come back. And I was praying with a missionary. Now, that's a miracle. That's a miracle. God moved on me, and I said, Sir, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, when Bertha came by the next time, uh, she, I, I told her about him, and she said, well, I'm going down there, and uh, I'll, I'll check to see how he's doing. Well, this is what happened. She went down there, and he got cold feet when he got there. He wouldn't tell his seminary students and his seminary professors and pastors in the area. It would put him in trouble with the denomination. But uh, he went down and was quiet for several months until Miss Bertha got there. She began to, he, he told her of his testimony, and then uh, she said, well, have you, have you told your, your faculty? Have you, have you told your wife? Have you told uh, others of your friends? And he said, no, no, no. She dressed him down. I mean, if you knew Miss Bertha, she could tell you off for an hour and have, have plenty left over for another hour. <laughs> And I mean, when she told you off, you knew you'd been told off. Well, she was going to be there a little while longer, and he knew he's going to either have to do what she said or go crazy one or the other. And so he began to tell his wife first. She was filled with the Spirit. His faculty began to tell them they were filled with the Spirit, and God began to fill people with the Spirit all through the life of the seminary. Now... That was a part of the ongoing of reviving. I want to talk about what I believe uh, is God's precedent. Remember, a precedent is something you set as a protocol that, is, uh, that, uh, that you can copy after and be right because God did it right the first time. You get it? So I'm talking about a precedent. And this is the way I believe it's going to work. The message that has been assigned to the church, not only by the frequency of the teaching of it, the kingdom of God, by Paul throughout Acts. And by the way, do you know how Paul ended, how Paul's life ended? He was at the time engaged in full-time teaching on the kingdom in a rented home 
uh, in, in, in Rome or somewhere around there. And, and God was blessing him because he had been faithful to preach the message of the kingdom. Now, I believe that this is, is what's going to happen. You hear rumbles of the kingdom. We hear it every time you come to church here, every time we come. This is, this is a kingdom-driven church. This is a kingdom-centered church. You, you can't come and not face the kingdom. You can refuse it. And, and, and when you do, you're farther from it than before. And it's going to, God is so bent on your coming to the kingdom that look out. Now, another example is Jesus. He came preaching the kingdom. Preached the kingdom for 40 days right after he arose from the dead. And, and uh, told the disciples to preach the kingdom. And uh, that's very, very clear. I believe that the preaching of the kingdom is going to herald a kind of preaching that will so spotlight the sovereign God. Now, there, there, are, there are emphases on the sovereignty of God that just stop right there. But the sovereignty of God means that he can do anything he wants to do, and it'll be right. God is God, and there's nobody else to take his place. And God is bound to bring light and whatever it takes for revival to come. And when a group of people have pointed their lives toward Jesus, put themselves under his ownership, and seek the kingdom first... Listen to this. Before he left, Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his system of justice, his righteousness, and all these things will be added. Now, what he was talking about in all these things was all the things that Gentiles or godless people seek in order to have human satisfaction and everything else as well. So when he said all these things, you need to investigate. Lord, what did you mean in all these things? And you start naming things. He said, yes, that too. Uh-huh, that too. Yeah, well, what am I going to do about making a living? Yeah, that too. What am I going to do about people talking about me? The kids won't understand. My boss won't understand. That too. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And God said, I will take care of this. Okay? Now. I'm, I'm headed into the body of what I want to tell you, and I believe I have light for today. So uh, let, me, let me try to get to where I'm going here without falling. And I want, I want to read you something. And if you've got a Bible with you, you uh, turn with me to 2 Peter. 2 Peter. If you don't have your Bible with you, ask God to forgive you. And don't ever come to church again without your Bible. Okay? Now, uh, in the book of Second Peter is the most majestic description of what a revived believer looks like, smells like, walks like, talks like. And I want you to listen to it. And then I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you something that I've fallen under conviction regarding today, this very day. Had I known what I'm about to tell you and knew that it ought to be preached, I believe what happened at that church could still be going on. Actually, another came who was not in favor of a lot that we did under the move of God's hand in revival. And he turned it another way, added another several thousand to the church. Before he left, had over seven or 8,000 people. But today the church has uh, been, been decimated and is probably not to 25% or even 15% of what it was. But I want to read to you the most, the most uh, blessed description of a person in revival, and here it goes. Simon Peter, 
This is 2 Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a slave and apostle. By the way, this is the, this is the, uh, uh, the Baptist uh, translation, really. Uh, it, uh, it is uh, still in, in print, and, and they're, they're, still, they're still getting it out there. And it's pretty, it's, it's solid. Here it is. Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who have obtained a faith of equal privilege uh, with ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? The, Second Peter is written to those who have a faith like all of us, Peter was saying. By grace, uh, my, may grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. There's much work done on grace today. Some of it is a disgrace. Some of it falls short of grace. Uh, some of it, it, it brings faith into, into such human subjection that it suggests that since God is a God of grace, everybody will be saved regardless of whether they believed in this life or not. Absolutely untrue. So here we go. For his divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness. Did you hear that? He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Uh, through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. By these... By glory and goodness, he's given us very great and precious promises uh, that through them you may escape, uh, you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world through faith. Now look at me. He is talking to you, about you, addressing you because you are in this group. And that's the thing I want to do list just a little tweaking on to tell you that had I known this as I know it right now at this moment at 8.50 p.m. on this uh, September uh, evening. Here it is. So just listen. By these he's given great and precious promises. You have before your vision great and precious promises in this book regarding you. And the purpose is that you may share in the divine nature. Listen, you have been added to the family of God if you're saved. Right now, you are given over to God. You made a profession of your faith. You invited Jesus into your heart, or however you did it, and you testify that you've been saved. Now, this is a picture of you. Escaping the, world, the, the corruption that is in the world because of evil desires. For this very reason, now listen, here is the pathway to revival personally. I personally believe that when one person gets revived, that person ought to act revived until somebody else uh, connected with them gives their life over to their influence and they become influenced by revival, and two people are revived. And they get together, and they form, after a while, a culture in the church that, that moves in the church like a virus. And everybody gets the kingdom virus, and everybody that gets close to them catches the highly contagious virus. Amen? And I believe this is what will happen. It took my publisher to do that. And I... I the Lord gives me time. I want to share something at the end. He'll give me time. But when my, my manuscript came back, first of all, I, I, I fought a battle with the devil over the kingdom. Look at me. I believe the devil hates the kingdom more than anything you could name. Of course, under that comes what God did through Christ and all that he's doing now all that he's doing through the Holy Spirit, and so on. So they, they changed my, uh, my, my byline at, in the title, the subtitle. Uh, my title was, uh, what's my title? 
the cosmic awa cosmic awakening. No, cosmic cosmic initiative. The kingdom of God is an initiative that God created when he created the earth. Revival is arranged so that if you veer from God's original suppositions and commands for your life, you can be revived. Revival is in your list of promises by the very nature of your acceptance of Jesus Christ. You took an upward move. The kingdom of God is the eternal, the eternal, continuous, inexorable highway to constant reviving the kingdom. And so I, I had a subtitle called A Treatise on the Greatest uh, uh, Theme in the Universe. And they, they laid it aside, and I was disappointed until I read theirs. And this was theirs. Discovering, the rediscovery, no, excuse me, restoring the kingdom, igniting the awakening. Now look at me. I personally believe that the preaching of the kingdom under the anointing of God will mean an ignition of the awakening wherever this happens. What happens after the ignition is really up to you and how God moves in your heart and how you respond to him. Okay, now let's go. And I, I've got one uh, that seems to be a little point, but it's huge. For this very reason, make every effort. Here we go. Make every effort to supplement or to add to your faith. Add, add to your faith goodness. And to your goodness, self-control. And to your self-control, endurance. And to your endurance, godliness. And to your godliness brotherly affection and brought to a brotherly affection add that to love now here we go I did not know this when I left that church and and uh, thought I was leaving it in good hands because I had preached on reviving and preached on what we were in Christ and so on and uh I believe that, that that could still be going on if indeed I had known what I'm about to tell you right now. There is a list of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Very common knowledge to you. In my opinion, this list of eight things, I, I don't know how to differentiate between some of them, but I believe that they are qualities of the kingdom life, descriptions of kingdom behavior, facets of kingdom thinking, and a revival will be, will move upon these like a motor uses the facets of a motor to keep on powering the vehicle. But let me do one little thing that may seem very small to you but indeed very huge, and we'll do something about that tonight. This is what I've said until now. It is all correct, but it's not all that is correct. So listen very closely, and I'll try to explain it. When you read that list, listen to it, faith, moral virtue, excellence, moral excellence, Knowledge, endurance, self-control, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. If I've named them all, there are eight of them. Now, here's the good news. Here's the good news. It goes on to say, if these things are not found in you, if you can name one that you don't have, 
or have in operation. You are going against the scriptures. You're not taking advantage of all of the truth of God. Because what Peter has said, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Look at me and let me say to you, there is nothing God gives you to mark your behavior, to mark your value, to be what you were made to be. There is nothing God has given you that is not in his eyes yours and in your possession right now. In other words, you're going to have to have faith to have faith. If you don't have faith that you have faith, you don't have faith. Oh, you do have it, but you're not acting it out because faith lays hands on faith. Well, you didn't catch it that time. I'll run it by you three or four more times. You're lost. Let's, let's say you're lost. You've never come to Christ. But you've come to him. And you say, I don't know how to believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, well, have you ever fallen off a log? Why don't you just quit trying and fall? I mean, it's an act of the will that introduces you to faith. Amen. All right, let me ask you, how many of you have faith? Now, the majority, how many of you have all the faith you need? Aha. All right. If you have faith, you have faith. If you have faith in his promise of having faith, you have the faith of the kind that when more is needed, more is supplied immediately on the basis of faith. Now, I often do this with congregation. I said, how many of you have faith? Well, they did what you did. How many of you have all the faith you need? And you checked your life right quick, and you didn't have enough the last time you wanted to pray for healing, and it was it didn't seem to be there. So you confess, well, I don't have the faith for that. I can tell you stories that, that have come so clearly to me in, in that. So I want to convince you of one thing. You have faith. I want you to tell me back. I, I have faith. If you have faith, he said as much as a mustard seed. You can move mountains. Just the faith, the little faith, is enough to cast a tree, pull it up by the roots and cast it in the ocean. So let's, let's go with I have faith. On what basis do you have all the rest? Faith. I have faith. I may not feel it. I may have never experienced it. I can't feature me being or doing that. But I have more faith in faith than I do in me. And I release the nature of faith in me right now. Now, are you getting this? Yeah. Three or four, uh, every sentence you're getting. I think after 87 sentences, most of you may have it. I have faith. I, have faith. I really have faith. I, really have faith. I, have faith. I have enough faith to call on faith. To call on faith. And the grace of God, the grace of God is revealed to me. From faith, to faith from faith to faith because I have faith, faith, I have faith. Many, many of you right now the leadership the, the church in the main have said we are naming ourselves something on the basis of the faith that it's God's will to build in this place a world touching world changing move of God you believe that? Yes. Okay, where does the faith come from? God. Comes through you from God. Amen. God's a God of faith. And he gives you the gift of faith. Now, I, I'll, I'll not do this all the way through because it's taking an hour. But I, I, I want to go through it right quick. How do you know you have faith? God said it. What are you going to do about that? You're going to do it. So when you believe, you are doing faith. Okay, the next thing he names is moral excellence. Moral excellence. Thinking right. Thinking uh, with, with divine boldness. Thinking nobly. Thinking of the good things. Thinking properly with God. Thinking 
along with God, thinking from God, and thinking of God, and finally thinking as God. And that's what we're learning to do. All right, go all the way through it, and this is what you'll find. If you don't have these things, then it proves you haven't discovered what God is all about. And so, uh, you, 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 can't, uh, you can't get what you're asking for because the enemy torpedoes your faith. Is that clear? All right, now let me make the one next thing that's clear. He said, if you do these things, all right, now, now watch me. If you do these things, you're going to be a part of watching your calling becoming an obvious election sure. In other words, you're going to become a living demonstration of the fact that God has wrought a miracle in you and you are a faith producer. Amen. Amen. Are you talking about the wrong one? Shut up. <laughs> that got you where you were and will keep you where you are. But if faith takes over, you will find yourself doing what you have. People who have faith believe. People who have moral excellence behave. People who have knowledge quit acting stupid. <laughs> Are you with me? Where did we get into this? We got into it through the door, sometimes that seems awfully small, of faith. I may not believe much, but what I believe, I firmly believe. And I believe that when I got saved, I got a gift of faith as standard equipment in my heart and mind and my thinker and, and everything that, that uh, heeds there too. Okay? Are you getting this? I'll be through in two minutes or 32, according to what you do in the next few minutes. If we do these things, we will never fail. Never fail. And here's the payoff. Are you ready? And I, I don't know how I missed it, but I missed it. I was, I was gone from there before I caught this. Therefore, brothers, put every effort into uh, to confirm your uh, election sure, your call it as an election sure. And if you do these things, you'll never stumble. For in this way, an eternal, a, a lavish and eternal entrance into the kingdom will be supplied to you. I, I really want you to examine this. I, I, I want you to examine my, my theology. Uh, I, I want you to step in. I want you to step in. See, we still are shattered by the Socratic, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Greek method of learning. We haven't learned something till we can define it, describe it, walk around it, explain it, and understand it uh, in our brains. Not so. It becomes real when we believe the truth, and the truth sets us free. You will know the truth. That's the first prophetic utterance. You will know the truth. All right, say it with me. I will. Say it again. Say it again. You sound so good. Convince a little more every time. And the truth will make you free. Truth will set you free. We have read it like this. You should know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth will not set you free until you know it. And knowing it is a feature of revelation, and God is giving you at this moment a revelation of biblical, God-born, heaven-sent faith. And you've said it over and over again. I, I'm a person of little faith. You point somebody with a lot of faith, 
I'll tell you this story and then I'm through. I was uh, a few years ago at on the mountain with uh, Andrew Womack. We had a wonderful experience together in which he recalled an instant 43 years ago when he met me after I'd preached a sermon, told me what I'd preached on, and he said, I came to you for prayer, and you prayed for me, and my wife had not been, and we had not been married long. And we were in a, in a house, and $160 was new, due for rent, and we couldn't pay it, and we were going to have to move out the next day. And, and I'm telling you this to, for a reason. And uh, he, he said, well, when he told me the first thing, he said, uh, I, I've owed you a debt, I've owed you for 43 years, and I'm going to pay you. I said, pay me. I didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> but after all, after he said all that, he said, here. And that had been a check for $1,000. And uh, that, that uh, spoke of, of uh, the kind of faith that came out of that prayer experience that moved him more firmly into faith. Today, I'm not taking credit for it, I'm just telling you, if you'll invest in the right thing, the world will think you bought it. And so I, 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 I can't prove anything but that he learned what he needed to learn in that little brace of time when I prayed for him. But uh, they're building for cash. Everything they do on the mountain is for cash. A $50 million program at the time. I think probably that phase of it's already done. Now, the last thing he did before he left is he said, I want you to come out to the mountain. I want to show you my, my business. By the way, three billion, three billion is the, is the uh, potential listening and watching audience on his television programs, three billion people. And uh, he said, Jack, we're going to have to stop building because we're building on cash. And, uh, and when we're on our cash, we have to stop building. And if we don't have $2.5 million by Friday, and that was Monday, we're going to have to lay aside the tools and wait for the next monies to come in. He said, I want you to pray for me that we'll have $2.5 million by the end of next Friday. <laughs> Lord, I've never prayed for three, for uh, $2.5 million. Uh, would you mind answering his fate instead of mine? And, and let me take credit for it. <laughs> of course, God goes on your faith. Your faith goes on God's promise about faith. That if you'll have faith in the fact that you have faith as God said you have faith, you have faith. <laughs> so, revived church is going to have revival. Yep. When are you going to have it? We got it. Amen. It's beginning to manifest. We have it all. Amen. It'll take God to get us ready. It'll take God time to get us ready for what he has ready for us. And I'm saying, let's go, Lord. I think I'm ready. If not, go ahead anyway, and I'll get ready quicker. <laughs> I'm talking about you. I wonder how many in this fellowship are saying, well, we, yeah, I, I really feel something there and really enjoy going. But, I mean, where's the revival? I don't know whether I believe it or not. Hey, you better believe it. Worst thing God could do is let you get out and get away before you find that God tells the truth and to your faith he speaks life and you have a reviving in your midst right now. You do not respond to it as husband and wife. That will come next. Or children and parents, that will come down the line. But you will respond individually individually right now. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief, but help my unbelief become belief. So we begin with faith. If you can't believe you have faith, how are you going to believe you ever have anything? Because all God gives is by faith. Are you with me? Yes. Hallelujah. Well, I'll just throw another little one at you. We needed money. We had run out of places to put their, their 
their cars and their carcasses. I mean, we, we were out of room. Church had grown from 500 to 1,000 and still growing, and we needed money. So we started uh, figuring. Well, if we had to give this much and so and so gives this much, and the people average this much, we'll have this much. God said, stop figuring and start faithing. How much do you need? Well, we need, we need at least a half million dollars. That was in the 70s when a half million dollars was mammoth. So we told the denomination that had a program. You always count on a denomination to have a program. And it generally is based on human ingenuity and human uh, figuring instead of faith. Faith doesn't figure. Faith receives and believes and God accomplishes. So we sent them our expectations. They, they wired back and said, you can't do it. You have this many members. This is how many you can expect. You can't do it. Cut it in half. And we went back and forth. I don't know how much by phone, telegram, or however. But I, I talked them into, uh, into a, a three-tiered program. I praise the Lord go. Uh, uh, hallelujah go. Uh, I praise the Lord go. One other go. And the final goal was a hallelujah go. We floated the deal. Came to the people. And first out of the bag. We met the first go. We waited, met the second go. We went on, made the third go. What happened? The people depleted? No. There were people who, who found how to get personally wealthy so they could give to God what they wanted to give. I, I'm thinking one man was in the, in the automotive repair, automotive part business, and he just took the challenge and, and uh, did this. Well, God, how much do you want me to give? I'll give what you tell me. And if you're not used to doing that, it's fun. Because yeah. God's not going to give you something you can do by yourself. That wouldn't be an act of faith to encourage on you. And he got personally wealthy and continued his giving. So, you're going to need money? You're already using your money to help people out of trouble, to love the lost to Jesus. Uh, and, and we need all the money we can get. No, you need all the money you can give away. Amen. And God is going to make... Well, what about little widows that are, on a, that are on a limited budget? Well, uh, let, me, let me tell you who put you on one if you're on one. You. Uh -huh. You start spending it God's way. I'm not talking about recklessly. I'm talking about listening to God and doing as you're told. So I'd just like to throw that at you with this thought. I've, I've really spent some time repenting today over the fact I, I was to leave. There's no doubt in my mind. I've never regretted having to leave the ministry of the last uh, 40 years and more. It is beyond anything I can describe uh, about what I thought and what could happen. But the one thing I left, not making clear, is that anything God wants you to have, He has already given you, but it is accessible only by faith. Enough faith to lay everything you are and have on the altar. You see, that, that missionary... Uh, president of the of the school in South America put all on the altar I'm, I'm giving it all and was filled with the spirit and became a spirit filled missionary father a father spirit in missionaries and uh, what is happening in the world God is preparing a church to be fathered and God has fathers and it will be family-centered. Uh, yeah. Many of you know, uh, Leif, my son, Leif Hetland, our son. My wife worked for him uh, before I took him, took her away from him. And uh, 
he said one day, he said, Papa, you say, uh, revival's coming. What is it going to look like? What is the kingdom going to look like when it comes? I didn't remember the conversation. But I did when he said, you said, I don't know. But I believe that God will preserve it only for a family. You're members of a fellowship, I suppose. You have a, a list of members that's not sinful. But if that's all there is, it'll become sinful. And so when you come and you say, God, I'm in. Last chapter in this book on cosmic initiative uh, came, came into being on Christmas two years ago. And I said, God, I really want something that'll that'll cling and sting and be meaningful. And I came up with a final chapter. You'll get the book, and I'll talk about that in a minute. You'll get the book, and you'll read the last chapter first, and you'll read about how the kingdom comes. Look at me. The kingdom will come as the kingdom has come from the beginning. From a willing God who is willing to transfer his authority to operate as kings and queens in his world, in his name, seeing the devil relent and run, that's when it's going to happen. And that will happen. Now this is what, uh, I haven't even talked to Frida about this, but we'll, we'll settle it. Uh, we want to we want to do a, a a rerun of the first book I wrote that chronicled this revival. A lot of it personal, uh, some of it I've shared, some of it I doubt if I've shared since it happened forty some years ago. But we want to we want to do you an edition of the book and make it available to you, and I'll write a brief preface for it and, and make it available to you, if indeed. You will say, I will do as I'm told. I will come to God and ask for faith to believe that I have faith, and on you go. And then you'll read the chapter on, uh, on how the kingdom comes. And guess what? When you obey and pray, like Jesus said, pray. Our Father in heaven, your name be hallowed. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you know what you're doing? You are saying to God, I wouldn't be asking you if I didn't mean it. I'm praying because I mean it. Accept my name, accept everything about me as believing you are sending for these days are reviving. Let's back for a moment before I'm through to precedent. The precedent in Scripture. Jesus preaches the kingdom for 40 days. He comes back with a group and says, Be still until you receive the promise of the Father. And the promise of the Father is the coming of faith at this level. And, uh, and you will become a personal impression, expression, exhibit of a work of God. And God will see to it that the world knows. If uh, even I, with limited, great, limited knowledge, could tell you everything I know that's going on right now, you would be enheartened. You'd be saying, good night. If I'd have known that, I'd, I could have believed easier. Well, you got it. Now believe. And, uh, and I'll be looking this way. So Tim and I and, uh, and Dimensions Ministers with uh, Frida uh, want to do a limited edition. We're going to do 100 to start with. And uh, they'll be yours as a gift. 
for myself, our family, and the organization. So before you... Now, if you get a little dishonest, I'll just shut the door. So, if you got a business card, or you want to write on, a, on something, one per family, please. And we'll try to have these done, oh my goodness, hopefully in 60 days, maybe in 30. So I want to do that. Now, I, I really feel like, from the beginning when we were talking about this, that this was the time when the members of this church, and, and very likely most of you are, can take ownership of God's way of reviving. Now, that'll save you from several things. First of all, it'll save you from checking whether this thing fits God or not. Well, if your opinion is all he has, God help him. You know. So I, I, I want you tonight to, to settle in and take ownership. Personally, you're not responsible for me or your neighbor or your daughter or your father or anybody in the family responsible to you. You say, well, I don't count. I'm retired. I don't care how many times you've been retired or fired. You count. You matter. And what you do means everything to heaven tonight. I don't know how we're to do this. Pastor, you and Charles, get your heads together over there. I want everybody that means business with God. I mean means business and can get on your knees. I understand the issue of getting on your knees at 86. Believe me, I understand in getting any position and then try to get out of it. <laughs> okay. So I won't be any more unfair to you than I am to me. So I want you to stand. I want you to decide right now what you're going to do about this. And among the things you do tonight, you can go by and give your name to more, not more than one per family, please. There may be other times, and the book will be available. Uh, it's, uh, it's the book that chronicles revival that I was telling you. Uh, it's gone out of print. We put it back in, but we're out of them. And the name of the book is The Key to Triumphant Living. And the key to triumphant living is that Jesus Christ living in the believer is the only hope, the only certainty of glory in your life. Christ dwelling in you as the living God who represents the God who rules the universe. And you become a tool of revival instead of a prohibition to it. So, Pastor, get ready to give direction. Charles, you help. And, and we're going to pray for everybody here who wants to be prayed to stand ready with hands out and hands down and say, God, I want to, I want to, I want to get in on it. Just like uh, Zacharias, who didn't understand, started with blank knowledge, blank faith, and wound up saying, well, I'm in, and went and tried to tell his wife, and God wouldn't let him talk. You can't talk her into it. You know what I mean. And before it was over, an 85, 90 year old man and a woman just as old were parents. <laughs> and the baby was born full of the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit at six months, a fetus inside. Life begins when? I don't know when, but it had already begun in Elizabeth. Hallelujah. All right, Father, in Jesus' name, direct these minutes. Use every one of us and lock us in if we're not in lockstep with what you want to do in your plan of revival. Put us there tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you for joining us today. I hope the word today has been impactful. I hope it's been meaningful. I hope there was something said today that struck you in your spirit, that you could ask the Holy Spirit to give you revelation on how you can use that in your life today. We thank you so much for joining us. We'd love to have you join us in the actual services at 
9 a.m. or 11 a.m. on Sunday morning at 851 Johnson Avenue in Stewart, Florida. And if you'd like more information about Revive Church, check out our website. It's reviveusnow.com. God bless. Have a great day.